when we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, there's a scene that's indistinguishable, that every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself, and as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. In this podcast, we will journey through the investigation and application of metaphysical means to enhance and inspire what I consider to be the great unifying purpose of our short human existence, the creative process. And it's my intention to learn and reveal exercises that ex-hex those inner oppressive thought patterns, as well as exorcising those lurking psychic vampires. So join me as I consort the unseen as means for getting the fuck out of creative stagnation. Stagnation that bewitches each and all of us, artists or not. So slither hither, weirdos and witches and cosmic snitches. Our guest today could be considered all three. He's a writer, a magician, a mason, and a tarot diviner amongst many things. His name is Eric L. Arneson, and fans of occult podcasts everywhere will know him to be the main host of the My Alchemical Bromance podcast. My fellow ordained reverend of the Universal Life Church just so happens to be my neighbor here in the Narrows of the Southeast Industrial District of Portland. Well, our fates collided, And his wisdom is unshakable as it is sobering. He knows his shit. And boy, does he take me to task on a couple of things. I wouldn't have had it any other way. Uh, For those of you listening through podcast applications, uh, the following is edited down for time. Uh, But those of you who are listening through our Patreon at patreon.com slash wethehollowed, you're listening to the full unedited hour 35 plus conversation haunt on the whole body of the United States mm-hmm. and um, so that's the 33rd degree but the 32nd degree in America it's super easy you it, once you're a master mason you can go join a scottish rite group and you get your 32nd degree in a weekend okay yeah. all right so it's kind of i i ask because it's personal to me my grandfather was a mason yeah uh, i think my father was for a short time he's kind of mum on it mm-hmm. uh but my grandfather uh passed away before i could really crack the code the code instead he would just tell me that he'd have to kill me if he talked about it (laughs) Um, which i wanted to bring up is i think i'm mired in a lot of the folklore maybe of it yeah uh probably what the general populace uh, considers to be you know just a kind of clandestine you know secretive order or fraternity Mm -hmm. and you know growing up you hear all these like rules and rituals that there are lots of rules and rituals but some you know that would be uh let's say hard feats uh for 
Well, I mean, okay, I'm going to, there's a, there's a little bit of a bubble that should be popped about fraternal orders Good. in general, right? Yeah. So like, first of all, the term secret society, mm -hmm. um, today in the, in, in our culture, it has a much different meaning than it had even like 50 years ago, 60 right. years ago. I'd probably say the JFK speech probably what turned that JFK one on. The, well, he talked about like, uh, that there are clandestine organizations. I think he referred to them as secret societies that we needed to hmm. battle as Americans. Or what? Yeah, I I'm, never heard I'm about this. Butchering the uh, <laughs> my summation of it, but yeah, I, I I think to me that seems to be the cornerstone of all conspiratorial thinking about fraternity. Well, <laughs> organizations like Mason. I would say that it goes back a lot further. Than that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we have evidence now that before Freem so Freemasonry became public in 1717. Mm -hmm. And um, before that, we've got pretty good evidence that Freemasonry probably was, uh, in a way, a secret society, probably serving more than one purpose. One purpose was probably political, in that it was used as a support network for um, uh, Jacobites, or like uh, people who were supporting the, the, the sort of like Catholic or the the crown mm -hmm. during the English Civil War, um, because after the king lost, well, the king he like super lost, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, but his supporters, a lot of them ran away to France, and uh, they probably used Freemasonry as, or at least Freemasonry was around. Uh, it, they probably didn't need it as a secret meeting thing since France kind of supported them. But that's probably part of it. Mm -hmm. And then another thing that happened is that Freemasonry was used as a kind of religious freedom secret society during that time in, in England and in the British Isles when you could get like executed for not being the right religion. Right. But this is a like like what the country was founded on people here, you know, oh, it's freedom of religion. But it was mm -hmm. a lot of people uh, escaping that to go full throttle more orthodox um, in a lot of ways and well different religions so it's i mean because i want we'll get to it later okay yeah but. i mean it's it's hard to it's like it's like freedom of religion like even the meaning of that has changed a right lot. and back yeah, then yeah. it was like freedom of religion meant that you could be puritan or right. quaker or catholic or anglican mm -hmm. or whatever um, <clears throat> or even Jewish, you know, I mean, like the, the idea was that you could just be a part of the church that you wanted to be a part of and not one that was sanctioned by the state because every, every country, every, sure. you know, principality or whatever had its own religion. Um, and you could get, and you'd get punished like sometimes super severely, sometimes losing your life, sometimes oh, yeah. exiled, you know, for being part of the wrong religion. And Freemasonry gave people an opportunity to sort of meet in secret with people regardless of which one of these religions they were in and discuss things philosophically or theologically or whatever okay. and have like an actual meeting place where they weren't being persecuted. Um, but in the 18th century, uh, freedom of religion or at least freedom to be whatever type of Christian you wanted to be right. was something that became more uh, pronounced and you know legal in England. I don't have exact dates on when that happened, right, but yeah. that's one of the reasons that Freemasonry was probably one of the inspirations for Freemasonry to become public at that time. And is it a, it's mainly a baseline Christianity? Well, it started Gnostic out. even? Uh, well, calling things Gnostic is really tricky. Because, right. you know, we yeah. didn't really have. I idea. meant it like, you know, just a more of a, you know, the proto Christianity. Cause it seems like it gets. Uh, mm, I would say, so it came out of um, building guilds like actual stonemason guilds or freemason guilds right. that were operative that actually like built churches and castles and that sort of stuff and if you look into like the history of those they have like this really rich tapestry of like legendary histories and um, passion plays and all that sort of stuff like in the in the middle ages you know before the renaissance um and before before protestantism started to sort of like stomp out like the cult of idols and the cult of like imagination and stuff mm -hmm. um all of these different trades guilds would be responsible for putting on like different passion plays and different you know theatrical arrangements so the theater stuff is is old and it goes way back and it's sort of embedded in kind of like the uh the, the sort of trade guild culture in europe but 
somehow in England and Scotland in the late 1500s and 1600s, it transformed from this, from from that into what Freemasonry is. Okay. Um, but the secret society thing, like even as early as the 1700s, you had uh, uh, like the Catholic Church claiming that Freemasonry was evil because it promoted freedom of religion and democracy. Right. And, uh, and you know, did things like denied the divine right of kings and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the secret society thing actually probably goes way back and I would say starts with the Catholic Church. Okay. So, you know, a lot of uh, modern day conspiracy theorists do some really weird things like conflating Freemasonry and the Jesuits and that sort of stuff. Right, story. right. Whereas traditionally, they would be enemies. And in fact, to this day, uh, the Catholic Church doesn't really have a very fond view of Freemasonry and doesn't really... And usually is sort of like saying, like, you know, our members can't be Masons. Mm -hmm. So there are no Jesuit Freemasons. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that makes perfect sense, considering that the Jesuits are like the Gestapo of the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, not comparing the two in any other way than oh, wait, just being on. very I militant. I should go back. Uh, the third uh, appended body that I wanted to mention earlier is mm -hmm. the Shriners. Right, uh, with the fezes. Yeah, with the yeah. fezes. Uh, and I'm not a Shriner, so I can't really talk a whole lot about him, but they... Is um, there a lot of cross... Um... Every Shriner is a third degree Freemason. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Yeah, you, yeah. Have to be a, you have to be a third degree... You have to be a Master Mason to join the Shrine. I see. Okay. And um, they... Uh, again, like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not a Shriner, so I can't speak like really definitively about them. But um, from what I've seen, they don't have a lot of like esoteric mystical content right but what they are is sort of a social club that also supports like these massive massive charities uh, probably the, the biggest one being like the children's hospitals that they run so that's that's what my understanding of modern masonry was was that it was just a charitable organ like fraternity of, yeah yeah uh, but you with your background and magic specifically mm -hmm. like what what led you to masonry did the magic lead you there or did did um uh, it's like hermeticism abermelon <laughs> you can't like, just throw words around <laughs> no i mean like it sounds like it's all um, like cooking in there y yeah i mean abermelon is a is a really really specific ritual and uh -huh. um there's no i haven't seen any evidence of the abermelon ritual in freemason okay right? so that's that's definitely not connected um but i uh I was kind of drawn to Freemasonry for probably two reasons. First of all, I had a desire to be like sort of um, part of my community a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I would suspect, you know, you know, now looking back, I would say that there was probably some part of me that was desiring like the initiatic experience, like the mark of like transforming from boy to man. Right. You know? um, and then the other thing was I was studying magic at the time. That was, mm -hmm. that was kind of right around the time when I uh, was getting really serious. And I, and in my studies, I was sort of like, oh, I think that the initiatic experience is important. I should go get initiated. And uh, my explorations were leading me to things like the, uh, the OTO. Mm -hmm. uh, it, where I was, there, wasn't a, there weren't a lot of options. I was down in Southern Oregon. And so I decided to become, a, I decided to petition the Ashland Lodge mm -hmm. in, in Ashland, Oregon. And got um, initiated because of that. And I would say that, you know, my, I didn't see a big connection between um, magic and Freemasonry at first. Okay. That, that, took, a, that took some study and some ex exploration and sort of like, you know, I mean, Freemasonry. So, yeah. So like getting back to like the secret society thing, like mm -hmm. our concept of secret societies now is, is super broken. Like we, right. we, sh we see them as these like dark shadowy Nefarious, organizations. Yeah. yeah. But if you go back to the early 1900s, uh, you know, even even up through probably like the 1940s or 1950s, you'll see the term secret society used for every fraternal organization. Right. So they'd be con so you would consider like the Elks and the Eagles mm -hmm. and the Moose secret societies. You'd mm -hmm. probably consider like Rotary a secret society. Secret society was kind of synonymous with fraternal order or sure, with, yeah. with the fraternal organization. <clears throat> and the other thing that 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 we seem to forget a lot when we're getting way into like how, you know, how far the rabbit hole goes and how deep the conspiracy is, is how common it was for people to be members of these organizations. Right, right. Um, 
so around 1900, the largest secret society in the United States was the Odd Fellows, and they had uh, probably half as many members as the Masons did. Um, the Masons came second, but then, like, it, it was something like 40% of adult Americans were members of at least one secret society. I figured Everybody. it was also just a symptom of class, too. Or it like wasn't, a... really, because no? Freemasonry is cross-class. Okay. So, um, at least in the United States, it is. So, in, in the United States, like, um, your typical Masonic Lodge now is not going... It, it'll have almost no people of um, upper middle class or higher. It's going to be mostly working class people. Okay. Uh, and a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of these fraternal orders are that way. But you have to remember that there was no easy um, entertainment, right? So entertainment was almost always uh, hanging out with people in your town or in your neighborhood or in your city. You know, there was, mm -hmm. this was before television. Um, and so fraternal orders, the secret societies, would host you know dances and and banquets, right. and feasts, and and public orations and lectures and you know, that was sort of, they were the social hub. When you were talking about the passion plays, I can see that kind of being the genesis of, mm -hmm. like, the theatricality of the ceremony and the oh yeah and the ritual. And, yeah, for and sure. Is, and is that more, um, these days, is that more mired in, like, aestheticism? Or is that? Um, I don't know. What do you mean by aestheticism? Like, is it more, uh, like, a traditional... Is it does it have less to do with kind of the metaphysical means of it really really depends on the lodge and the group yeah. of the group of people you're working with so that's the other thing is every lodge yeah. is is its own thing mm -hmm. so um different lodges have different focuses so some lodges are very very focused on community service yeah. and they're they basically are doing things like uh, you know soup kitchens or charities or supporting public schools or things like that um other lodges will be focused on you know sort of like research and history. So for instance, in Portland, we have the, uh, what do they call it? Oregon Lodge of Research. Uh, that's not the name. What is it called? Research Lodge number, no, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it's the Oregon Lodge of Research. It's number 198. Okay. You can look it up on the internet and see. Um, and the, uh, but then, and then you've got lodges like mine, Esoterica 227, which is focused more on like the philosophical and esoteric parts of Freemasonry. Right. So, so lodges tend to be really different. And even, you know, across the United States, you know, if you go to, you know, there, so like every, um, every state has its own, um, its own grand lodges. So okay. they're all, each state usually has one or two grand lodges and they're totally sovereign. They aren't really beholden to anybody else. I was going to ask, is there like an overarching? Um, there is, there is for Scottish Rite, okay. but there is not for Blue Lodge Masonry. So Blue Lodge Masonry, like every state is its own thing. Mm -hmm. um, there are many, many different branches. Um, so, you know, for instance, like, uh, uh, and the, there are also many different rituals. So like Oregon has a different ritual than Washington or a different ritual than California. Like, you right. know, you, they're, they're, they're similar, but they're not the same. Now, is that due just to, you know, the growth of those different cultures, like um, where they're located? Kind like, of. Because it's so... They're like meandering away from. The... Yeah. So, I mean, if you go back far enough, uh, no two lodges had the same ritual. Okay. So they might have had like passwords and handshakes that they were the same. Like, mm -hmm. so the, the methods of recognition so that one Mason can prove that he's a Mason to another lodge might have been the same. But aside from that, their rituals would have been particular to each lodge okay. with, with similarities, but mostly very particular to each lodge. Um, yeah, I suppose I always assumed that there was like this over, like a, a guide, a, you know, like an overarching. Mm -mm. No, because it was all oral tradition. Right? Okay. It was all Very oral cool. tradition until yeah. the 1800s. So in the 1800s, we started writing ritual down. There's a there's a pretty good book that sort of ex, uh, explores like the history of Masonic ritual. Mm -hmm. um, and there were a couple of really big pushes in the 1800s to standardize Masonic ritual in the United States. So for instance, if you... Uh, if you're intimately familiar with like the Oregon ritual and you go to Washington, it'll be very familiar, even though you don't necessarily know every single word, it'll be, okay. you'll, you'll still like, there's still it. coded language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's definitely coded all. language and mm -hmm. there's definitely like phraseology and, you know, various like archaic terms and things that get used over and over or stuff like that. And this is like, yeah, transcontinental. Like nope. No, no, no. It it totally it's different in every I mean, country. I mean the coded language. Like um, no, even that. Like okay. there might be some phrases or names or cool. words or things like that that are the same, but um, but no, it it varies a lot. Like you know you yeah. you know the uh, 
in in American Freemasonry in the United States, in the United States, uh, the the Blue Lodge degrees all center on what we call the Hiramic legend, which is the legend of the building of King Solomon's Temple mm -hmm. and the architect that built it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in other countries, you might not have that at all. To me, that seems like a good basis for the magical aspects is the Solomonic. Y yeah, that's something that I that I have only just really started thinking about a whole lot, but. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you want to segue into magic a little bit, you know, so I've been, yeah, absolutely. I've been uh, recently sort of like researching and working with the Greek magical papyri, mm -hmm. which is probably like the oldest collection of magical texts that we have in the Western world. I think I heard your interview, someone, they just translated it. Um, it's been translated for a while, but it's the sort of thing where we didn't, we weren't really paying a whole lot of attention to it much. And now a lot of, um, you know, magicians and occultists are starting to pay attention to the to the Greek magical papyri, but you know, I mean, like the the Bornless Rite, which is one of which is a Libra Samic, one of uh, Alistair Crowley's famous works, is based on um, a translation of the Greek magical papyri mm -hmm. or a fragment of it from like the 1850s. So these fragments have been around, right. but they have never, you know, they're, they've only recently really been like collected and cataloged, and you know, like Stephen Skinner, who's a Pretty well-known occult author. Yeah, the Enochian. Uh, yeah, yeah. He might have Doctor Skinner. He's he's like a big Enochian oh, yeah. magic. He's done a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. but he's but he basically cataloged all of the Greek magical papyri and Very made cool. this great book where you can sort of like look up what's going on. Um, but one of the things that he points out is it's really interesting in the Greek magical papyri. A lot of times the the practitioner, when he's doing a work, will be like. You know, I am Apollonius of Tiana, listen to me, or I am Moses and I did this and this and this, listen to me, where he like fakes, you know, the practitioner lies about who he is, or is like taking on the, the role or the guise of some historically important figure. Okay. Um, and the thing, so one of the reasons that's really interesting to me in terms of masonry is in, in Freemasonry, as you progress through the chairs, when you become the master of a Masonic lodge, you're basically taking the role of King Solomon. Mm -hmm. And and oops, let's kick the microphone. That's all good. Um, but to me, that was that was that that's really interesting because of the role of King Solomon in Solomonic magic. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I personally don't do a whole lot of Solomonic magic, but I've encouraged other Masons that I know who are doing Solomonic magic to explore that. I haven't heard back from anyone. <laughs> yeah, they've all mysteriously vanished. Right? Yeah, the. Uh... His demons learn their names. <laughs> and I mean, is that kind of a basis of it? Is trying to uh, guise yourself from the spirits? That... Yeah, you know, I've heard a lot of people speculating and I don't think anybody really knows for sure. sure um, yeah. I think one of it is, you know, uh, the Greek magical papyri doesn't treat um, spirits and gods and demons and stuff the same way that like later grimoires do. And a lot of times it's sort of, you get the impression that not only are the spirits sort of treated like idiots, but they're sort of treated as like lesser beings to be bossed around. And mm -hmm. I think the thing is like, uh, one of the speculations I've heard is that spirits can't tell us apart. We all look the same. Human Humans, you know, we're just... I see. We, we all look the same. Though. Right. So they can't tell if you're Apollonius or Solomon or Moses or right. Keats. I love this metaphysical caste system. Yeah. They have <laughs> like, we should be on the other side of the street. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> barely. Like, um, I wanted to get in. Well, I think what I conflated uh, the uh, Abram Abram. Am I saying that right? The Abram. Uh, you know, Abramelic. Abram. Abramelin. Abram yeah, Abramelin. That you, sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah, I said it right the first time. I I think I was just thinking about it too hard, which happens all the time with working with magic. I've found. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, what I conflated that was there that ritual needing to be done when you're 40 years old, right? Is that what it says? I, I'm I'm pretty sure. I, I might be talking out of my ass, but I'm pretty sure that, or I'm confusing that with the another thing. Well, there but is, there was some like age, like only when you're 40. Oh, you, you might be thinking now... of, um, there is a late tradition in Kabbalah, in Jewish mm -hmm. Kabbalah, that you shouldn't start studying Kabbalah until you're over 40 years old. Right. And that I, could be part of it. I, I, yeah, I thought it was something else too, but this is this is the common thread that I see. Yeah, I, especially honestly, as you know, someone uh, on the early side of thirty mm -hmm. that's really digging deep into this. There is this kind of 
um, I don't know, uh, reward almost about getting old. (laughs) Well, just getting to a point like finding that, you know, degree of which now I can, I know myself and 40 seems to be throughout a lot of, you know, devotions to be the age where like, okay, you can become a magician now. Yeah. I mean, I started, um, you know, I mean, my first introduction to to magic was when I was a kid, Mm -hmm. but um, I'm not sure. I, you know, my understanding, like in Kabbalah, where they've got a 40 year old Mm -hmm. uh, requirement, my understanding is that sort of came about pretty late and primarily because of the rash of um, fake prophets, the, right. the people claiming to be the Messiah that happened, um, such as uh, Jakob yeah, Frank. 33. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in prim- uh, primarily uh, Sabatai Tzvi, who, um, who was a total freak show. Uh, Go on. My apologies if there are any <laughs> Sabbatans out in the audience. I, I don't mean to in- insult your religion. Oh, but... I don't think there's anybody in the audience yet. <laughs> <laughs> podcasts last yeah. forever you know i know right? um but uh sabotage v i i'm not gonna be able to remember his whole story really accurately but he um he rose to prominence i think when he was in his 20s or maybe 30s he claimed to be the messiah he got this huge following he got uh he got like a bunch of his followers to he ended up like apostatizing so he converted i think from judaism to christianity and then like from Christianity to Islam. And then like the whole time he was always, he'd always be telling his followers like, I'm, I'm just faking it. I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish at home. <laughs> um, but he was such a mess and he made such a bad name for Kabbalah and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff that I think that it was after that, that they really started being like, you should be older before we teach you this weird shit. Not to mention just the discrepancy in those devotions mm-hmm. having oh, that. Yeah way back and forth i was raised catholic I think he'd... for the first half of my childhood and then jewish for the second half and oh yeah even just that you know yeah um it, i mean it wasn't it wasn't too major but i can imagine it being maddening if you're trying to be the messiah of either at any time yeah i think he also <laughs> was uh i think a lot of times it was sort of like under pain of death or imprisonment or something where he'd get like captured by right if i remember correctly his um his islamic stint was somewhere in the middle east where he uh he got like in bad trouble with like a local islamic king who was like you convert and you make your followers convert as you do or we're just gonna kill y'all because mm-hmm. you guys are jerks because <laughs> <laughs> homie don't got time for that yeah <laughs> but yeah i you know and i think when embarking on this you know i'm always trying to rectify my chaos magic upbringing I feel. Yeah. Once you start getting serious, there's a lot of bad habits. There are. Um, um, as as a chaos magician, naturally though, it was I, I'm absolutely grateful for it, especially in regards to art and kind of. Oh, absolutely. I think that in the artistic sense, but like, yeah, these uh, there's just incessant need or like subconscious need to just burn everything down and make it my own. You know, it's. <laughs> Is going to be a, it's going to be a tough road. Hey, have you thought of uh, declaring yourself the Messiah? Maybe getting your followers to. <laughs> so you don't listen to the podcast. <laughs> I listen to an episode. I'm just I'm just <laughs> Start off every episode. This is the Messiah. Oh, it's got to be a cooler slogan than this is the Messiah. Uh, you, I think it was you that told me once uh, when we first met, uh-huh. uh, by the way, uh, Fancy that we both ended up living in the same neighborhood. Um, I think you, how did we, we got together. You I found had you on Montana the Jordan on your podcast. No, it was before that. I found you on the internet somehow. Right. I think it's because you were ha- going to have Montana Jordan on. So you, yeah. And I was looking up Montana Jordan yeah, appearances yeah. To, to see. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, when we first met, we met at our, our local Local watering, uh, hole. watering hole, yeah, that's a nice, <laughs> nice way to say it. But uh, we, you told me once because I, I've been struggling a lot too. I mean, just as an artist, and um, you know, let alone uh, someone with any kind of uh, metaphysical, you know, 
curiosity mm -hmm. on how to apply certain things to kind of sustain uh, financially or otherwise, you know? Oh, yeah. And uh, a lot of it comes from just my just sheer disinterest and self-promotion or marketing to. and uh i mean I, no, that I, totally... I had and then we were talking and you brought up a good point and this was completely um solidified by my other good friend jimbo kennedy who had been on the podcast too who's also kind of in the same game that mm -hmm. modern magicians are marketers or like yeah or, yeah um, or some form of you know kind of because we create images we right. manipulate using images like it's it's that the same flipped me on my head then yeah. it became a game to me again it, or not a game but it, it became a serious uh you know avenue yeah so it's sort of like you know i mean you were talking about using chaos magic for art mm -hmm. um and if you're using chaos magic for art and creating uh you know like a a sigil in a painting or a mm -hmm. sigil in a work uh, just to affect you, that's one thing. But if right. you're using it to affect the audience or whoever's viewing it, that's something else. I mean, yeah, and that's... Marketing that's... is basically chaos magic on an audience. It's creating sigils and symbols. You are and guiding others' you're, will. You are, you are manipulating the yeah. wills and minds of other people. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that... Yeah, I mean, this is an idea that I, I'm not going to claim this for my own. This no, is an no, idea. I no, totally absolutely. Because uh, I mean, when, once you get down to the nitty gritty, it's like, oh, these motherfuckers have known this forever. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's and and, it, and it, you can look and it's it's fairly obvious. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I got it from uh, Juan Culiano, who's mm -hmm. a, a Romanian historian. I, I didn't get it from him personally. I got it from one of his books. Mm -hmm. But um, he's basically, you know, he he his whole thesis in this book was about sort of the death of the imagination in, in European culture and how um, we've sort of taken the ability to imagine or the ability to use our, our inner vision to like create and, and manipulate and affect our environment. And we have pushed it off into sort of the, the nether realms of our psyche. Mm -hmm. So we, we sort of like diminutize and infantilize, infantize, one of those it's is probably a word. Infantilize. Yeah, yeah, but whatever we do, we, we take the imagination and we turn it into a child's toy. So we're like, oh yeah, that's just happening in their imagination. Right. Or, or that's just pretend. Um, and then we turn around and use that same power, that same imaginal power to do things like propaganda and- Oh yeah. You know, national symbolism and patriotism. The Kardashians. Uh, the Kardashians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah, like, how did the Kardashians end up being? I don't. Not only like to me, that's weird black famous, magic. You know, yeah, they're they're weird famous <laughs> plastic people, but they're also bad guys in Deep Space Nine. I mean, they're they're. <laughs> I, I just, it's just incredible to me. This, I mean, we were talking about YouTube earlier, and it's like, mm -hmm. it's I don't know what the machine is or what, uh, for lack of a better term, and forgive the pun, but the trick, like. Yeah. is that people are mining and mining and mining and it's working and working and working. You so know? part of it is that that using magic to interfere with the will of another person mm -hmm. or to, to is, me that's is black magic. No, no. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, that's, that's not something that that's you're rule supposed one. to do. Yeah. And a lot of times you're sort of told, like, don't do this. Like, don't, don't practice magic that's going to affect another person without their consent. Right. So right. advertising and stuff like that is, is kind of not <laughs> good magic. Um, just essentially, yeah. But it's also something that you can't help but do, mm -hmm. right? So, right. I mean, like I said, yeah. Just as an artist, I mean, this just finished. This my record came out today, and yeah. now I'm in the process of, you know, figuring out the the different facets of, you know, when to post an Instagram about it or what, you know what I mean? Like all these weird little, yeah, uh, machinations. One must go to help sell something and honestly you like know? if you are doing like free social media stuff then mm -hmm. the answer is you post all the time and you basically right. whore yourself out right and yeah. you basically are like hey you, you got you know ten thousand followers i'll give you my music for free if you post about it or something right, like that right, you, know, you yeah. just have to and there are there's some like you know good guy mechanisms that yeah it's it does seem a bit like a, a digital trade and barter when it gets mm -hmm. to a certain point but like there are just so there's so much availability to, you know, just jump over any of that. 
to yeah. kind of you know cut cut that kind of a commendable corner and go straight for the buying followers buying blah blah blah. You yeah, know I mean? don't buy followers no, because that's, that won't help, right? Because you still need but to, to have. To me, it's like it's obvious when they do. Yeah, and like oh, yeah. it's it's just it bewilders me that you know the common sense wouldn't you know uh, wouldn't pick up on that. Wouldn't feel like I a, it wonder just, if they do. Yeah, I mean, the th it it really. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know. It depends on you know what your aim is. I mean, I don't know if you're trying to be Madonna or if you're no. trying to be Coil. Oh, yeah. uh, no, not even that. Yeah, <laughs> just trying to sustain, to ah! keep on making these things. You know, I mean, that's kind of the whole point to me. I mean, that's a, something that I resigned. Yeah, or resolved, I should say, like a long time ago, was that. I, to have the freedom to do multiple artistic things is far more important to me than to drown in in one. And, right. You know what I mean? And yeah. to me, that already was saying, you're not going to make a living doing this. <laughs> I, you know, I <laughs> or suspect Or just that, this one thing. You know? Yeah. And I mean, you know, I mean, art, you mm -hmm. know, making a living doing art, you, I, I feel like a lot of times from, from what I've seen, you either, you know, get lucky mm -hmm. and make stuff that people are eager to consume. Or you have a combination of stuff where you, uh, you do the stuff that you love, but you also have right. some sort of commercial part of your art that might even be making like stuff that isn't yours, or right. you're know, doing like graphic design or studio musician work or something like that. Exactly. Like, that doesn't really demean no, you as an artist. It still takes the skill that you've learned and puts it to use. But you're also, you know, not utilizing those things for your personal work. So you got to do both. Yeah. yeah, you have to do, and that's a struggle, you know. I mean, yeah. I'm a I'm a professional writer. I know, yeah. And finding time and energy to work in my personal writing mm -hmm. is tough, you know. Like I've never finished a book, right? And yeah, I've God. certainly started plenty of them. Oh, me too. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm like just doing the word counts a day, oh. uh, to the point where like I I'm just breaking in finally through that brain barrier where. I'm now just completely too exhausted and everything's coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I mean, I definitely don't meet any sort of word count right. uh, Which, goal every day. But I, I do a thing where where I'm like, I'm going to... I'm shaking all the mics. There. I kicked mine earlier. I know. So that's cool. It's ghetto. <laughs> Sorry about that. But yeah, so... You have mic stands. I don't have mic stands on my podcast. <laughs> if you could call them that, yeah, I guess they're mic stands. This is totally... Yeah, this is the mic stand. Um... Yeah, I mean, for me, so my uh, the way I get myself to write every day is I have a, a rule that I write not zero, not zero things. Right. So, but I mean, that's like it's like harm reduction, almost. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like just just do anything. Yeah. This here Pragmagic podcast is brought to you by Portland, Oregon's open source art religion and Pragmagic Art Collective. We the Hallowed. For more information, please visit we the hallowed.org or support these fine, pious individuals at patreon.com slash we the hallowed. Remember, that's hallowed like saintly. H A L L O W E D. Thank you and haunt on. Um, but yeah, so we were talking about uh, daily rituals that you implement that have helped you out right. over so, the years. And so, you were talking about the LBRP. Oh, yeah. So I don't, I don't do the, the LBRP uh, daily mm -hmm. now. Uh, in fact, I don't use it a whole lot. Um, but you do still implement it? Well, yeah. I mean, I've got my, my own version that I sort of right. uh, crafted over the years. It's based on it um, mm -hmm. that I do use uh, with ritual. But for daily stuff, mostly meditation. I found meditation right. is probably the the most useful. I mean, it's useful not only just from a magical standpoint, but just like for a person, mm -hmm. you know, just to maintain mental health. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's been the complete baseline. Every time I've I've discussed this, a daily practice is something something as simple as that. Yeah. When I talked to Anthony Alvarado on his uh, radio show, The Magic Hour. Uh, he kind of asked me a similar thing, but in more in the vein, like, how do people get started in this? And it's like, it doesn't matter if it's how does someone start to embark on a metaphysical path or if it's how do I just feel better? It's meditation. You can't even. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like if you don't have a meditation practice or right. some sort of skill in meditation, you can't do 
you, yeah. you, you're not going to do magic. Do you ever um, like do? So another thing that scares me about a lot of uh, modern magic, I see it being utilized a lot in desperation. You know, um, and I feel, I feel that like that's be... not just modern. Right. I think that a lot of it is desperation. It is sort desperate. Of. Okay. And yeah, totally. Um, you know, because, you know, one of the things you learn is that, you know, there's always like that sort of path of least resistance. You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you need 500 bucks, you're going to have an easier time, you know, selling something to get 500 bucks and you are you know, yeah. summoning $500 from the ether or whatever. <laughs> right. So, so yeah, I mean, I think from a lot of Braxis, times, yeah. yeah, it does, uh, it does sort of come from desperation okay. because, you know, otherwise if you don't need 500 bucks, why, why would you even feel like I'm going to do a, yeah. a ritual to get $500? Guess, but to me that, that, that's a lot of, uh, you know, conforming your subconscious to make sure that that happens rather than, like the full process of communing with something yeah you know, like uh and maybe desperation is not the right word i just i feel like it gets in i just i notice a lot instead of like preemptively or like um how do i put it like uh, like disciplining mm -hmm. um yourself where if you were you know practicing these things daily that that would more than help you know instead of you know when when it hits when shit hits the fan and then you go mm -hmm. you know consult the lesser key of solomon and um i know. suspect i would say that probably both are important you know now, do you find that there's like a that would be a, a, a there would be a negative connotation to that no i no. don't think so i think um you know it, one of the problems is you, you know you magic might not work right so right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing and uh you know you, you the, the the thing is like you can't just sort of like if you want you know, if we you know, we're going to go back to the 500 dollar example like if you want 500 dollars, you don't just like make some ritual to get 500 dollars and then just sit back and wait right and then you get still bumped gotta, when it doesn't happen yeah, yeah. you still got to work you know there's mm -hmm. the the it's it's not like you know magic helps those who help themselves I right it's probably a better way to it. And I guess in a way, and I've heard this a lot too from friends uh, in in you know these uh, in the in the practice and doing the great work. I'll say mm -hmm. that uh, kind of think that that helps weed out the uh, <laughs> the the lesser yeah uh, interested parties. It's almost like oh yeah no let them. Mm -hmm. Let them think that that's what it's for only, or yeah. you know. I mean, so so like broadly, you can break magic into two categories. You know, you've got theurgy and thaumaturgy, right. where, where theurgy is the the side of magic that's interested in self development and connection with like a divine source and like you know purification of the soul mm -hmm. or repairing of the world or that sort of thing. And thaumaturgy is more, you know, doing um, like practical magic or talismans or things that that are meant to you know, directly help you in the physical world. Mm -hmm. So, so a magician usually, or a magician probably should be somewhat practiced in both of those, mm -hmm. but, um, it, you know, it, it depends on the practitioner, you know, some right. practi practitioners are going to be more focused on one than the other. Uh, I personally am more on the theurgic side of things, so I don't right. do a lot of like the practical sort of stuff, but I do from time to time. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, out of desperation. Sometimes it's more out of just needing to keep in practice. Covering Some, your bases. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes it'll be, you know, based on whatever system I'm working on. Um, like currently I'm doing a lot of uh, uh, what they call probably like astrological magic or image and image magic that's based on um, uh, like the Picatrix and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And with that sort of system, a lot of ritual has to be appropriately timed. And right, it's and, very calculated. Yeah. And so yeah. sometimes I will notice a particular good time for something coming up and I'll be like, oh, I should craft a ritual based on that. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely you're, something you're that I've done. Finding it, a, uh, an equation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And even then, sometimes you can do it for thaumaturgical reasons. So, for instance, um, during the so Venus was exalted earlier this year, 
Um, we just saw her too, right? She oh was, yeah, uh, she she's she's up still there. Yeah. She's up right now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but every planet has a particular spot in the sky where it's considered exalted, which is probably like its second most powerful position in the sky. And so when I noticed that was coming up, I was like, oh, I should make, you know. And so I, I checked the charts and all that kind of stuff. And I, so I crafted a ritual around Venus, mm -hmm. um, not because not out of any sort of desperation, but just sort of like a offering or yeah kind of an offering um i'm on your side don't hurt me <laughs> <laughs> yeah that sort of thing totally um so so yeah i mean like it, it really yeah. depends like sometimes you do it out of desperation and sometimes you don't you know i've done right i've done you know i've done chaos magic stuff that has just been intended to be like you know to to help things along and i've mm -hmm. done you know rituals that have been to create talismans that all they do is get me closer in touch with certain influences or or mm -hmm. elements in the universe or whatever and it it really it really just kind of depends i i don't think that desperation necessarily negates it but i think a lot of times you still you know i mean it, it's good to be ready right it's it's like anything you you don't just pick up a guitar and play it right you gotta you gotta do your chords yeah and your scales well, chaos magic, <laughs> punk rock. Um, yeah, but or maybe you're just maybe you're just a garage rock. Yeah, uh, guitar I, um, enthusiast. Well, I mean, I you're playing somewhat of a devil's advocate. But I, I was just telling you outside about my eclipse ritual, which mm -hmm. was in desperation. It was probably the biggest thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. uh, man, did it work! Um, yeah, uh, but that I always kind of felt a gnawing of a little bit of guilt like maybe i'm taking advantage of of the systems uh because of the intent or i'm obviously overthinking it all the time <laughs> uh, um because the it, the intentions were good it yeah. was you know there is this like um this weird appeasement i have to feel for you know the unknown forces and it's it's uh, it's not a, a scare or uh paranoia it's more of like i just want to make sure i'm being respectful because you never know what you know all right well there is something that, that you can do about that yeah um there's a couple things so first of all um you can do divination mm -hmm. before you do your ritual to check it you know is this a good idea should i be doing this that sort of thing and you can use like Pendulum tarot or, cards or yeah. pendulums or, or something like that mm -hmm. um and the other thing to do is to make sure that you um make offerings or you know supplications to deity or yep. something of that nature that's why so much uh, magic involves prayer offerings and prayer mm -hmm. yeah, yeah absolutely gratitude to me is the cornerstone yeah and i yeah. think gratitude you know so uh yeah gratitude is very important and i guess uh typically when i craft a ritual it will include offerings or or supplications of some sort just you know because you you, you don't want to you don't want to be a bull in a china shop. No, yeah. yeah, and you also, like I said, you just don't want to uh, disrespect things that you are obviously giving credence to the possibility of being. Yeah, you know, right. like, <laughs> it's not just you know, oh, it's cool. I'm just conforming my subconscious to help me figure things out. It's like, well, no, come on, you're doing this because there's a big possibility that there are some outside forces that are probably, yeah, you know, yeah. Hopefully on your side. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just... I, it, that brings me to another point of uh, through a magical path, um, have you implemented anything that has... Like, uh, before you embark on anything major, mm -hmm. is there a certain devotion or ritual um, that you are gravita gravitated to personally not just that you think um all should or sure maybe both so for me um like something that i almost always do uh like i i use prayer a mm -hmm. lot and you know prayer is a is a form of magic oh um, yeah we we really like to differentiate them in in our post pagan world mm -hmm. you know so you know, prayer is sort of associated with like, oh, this is good and godly and blah, 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 blah. But, but, right. but almost any old ritual you look at in, involves prayer. You know, yeah. prayer is, is present and an intimate part of magic. So I use prayer a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and even, even when I'm meditating, I typically open with a prayer. And I use the 
uh, the prayer that's found at the end of the first book of the Corpus Hermeticum. Um, I've got a link on my blog we can put mm -hmm. in the show notes if you okay, want to. Okay, awesome, but, yeah. But, uh, but I use that. Um, a lot of times I'll even use that prayer as sort of, uh, I don't know exactly what this practice is called. I heard once that it was called, it was similar to the centering prayer that's uh, popular in certain uh, forms of Christianity, but it's basically just a receptive way of like sitting, reciting the prayer and kind of relaxing into it. You mm -hmm. know, that, that tends to be helpful. Um, I also use, uh, I also use some uh, Kabbalistic stuff that, yeah. that is uh, pretty uh, useful. Probably the best for anybody who's just starting out would be the middle pillar ritual, which mm -hmm. is, you know, taught in a lot of golden dawn systems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's a very powerful one. Mm -hmm. um, then in addition to that, uh, I use, uh, especially when I'm doing like spirit work or work that requires like a magic circle or something like that, mm -hmm. I use the um, beginning part of the 231 gates from the Sefer Yetzera, which is not easy and takes a lot of practice. But once you you know, have gone through all of the steps and learned how to do that particular um, ritual. It's, uh, it's, I found it to be extremely efficacious. Yeah, deeply meditative. Deeply meditative, yeah. 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 Uh, speaking of circles, um, I wanted to touch base about, uh, you know, magical communities and how mm -hmm. one, you know, might break the barrier of, you know, I mean, for yeah. the podcasts like this, it, it's, it's obviously not, it's it's obviously kind of in vogue these days. So it it's is. not it's not it's been in vogue for a long time. But finding and deciding the right the right one community because like within the Masons you guys all have your own separate yeah. you bring a lot of different things together. You do. Which is great and it's not you're not subscribing to one or conforming to one ideology. It's Right. So Aside from Masons, like what would another kind of organization yeah. be easy to find? Aside from, you know, well, probably online forums and the easiest uh, organization to find if you is probably the OTO. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not strictly a magical organization, but you're going to find a lot of uh, magical oriented or occult oriented people. Oh, I thought in they OTO. were strictly. No, they're a fraternal order. They're, oh. they're a fraternal order, but they also are attached to like a, you know, a very esoteric religious order. Uh, right. They have a magical order called the AA that's associated with them. Yep. The astral. Uh, yes. I've heard that the uh, ast uh, astro argentum, mm -hmm. I think, is like the, the, the name that is thrown around a lot. The but I've heard that that's not no. real. Oh, is that, that another Crowley uh, awesome. middle finger? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, because uh, in the it's amazing how many middle middle fingers Crowley had. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, never mind. I was gonna go dirty with that, but um, <laughs> I feel. But, but in the modern world, so aside from the OTO, like finding a magical order, because there is the an air of needing to be clandestine. Yeah, and maybe that's so not the right most word, of them but... are pretty secret. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's, and that's so there's like, a, there's like a Wiccan, Wiccan covens, sure, covens. Sorry, however you say that word, covens. Coven. Um, <laughs> but Wiccan covens, uh, like I don't actually know of any. I know that there are some in Portland, but I don't know any of any personally. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, that's tied to a specific religion. Um, the OTO is also tied to a specific religion. Um, you know, you can find like Golden Dawn groups if you want. Right. But even then you're going through, you know, it's sort of like a a pretty regimented teaching right. system and a very specific system. And it works really well for a lot of people. Like a lot of people do that and are very satisfied. Uh, personally, I, I kind of feel like a lot of magic stuff is meant to be solitary. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say, you know, if you can find a church that fits what you're doing, you know, there are a lot of alternative sure, sure. and underground churches and like, you know, liberal Catholic churches and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I guess what I was talking about, because, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree that it is a solitary venture. Yeah. Probably. And but finding Foremost, I think but... the community is important. I mean, but yeah, the, and I think it's, it's one of the reasons I came to Portland. Right. Is because Portland is filled with weirdos. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a cliche for a reason. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I love that, right? Like yeah. it's, it, you can find people doing all sorts of stuff in Portland, but, mm. um, yeah, I mean, we up on, up the street here have the Sekhmet, uh, oh, temple, yeah. Yeah. which is maybe an, I think it is an OTO chapter. That's an OTO. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, I gave a lecture there once. Oh, nice. Yeah, I did a tarot thing there. Mm -hmm. But um, again, you know, when you find these things, it, it is kind of mired in a, a certain... It's always, structure. if, you, if you're going to join a group, it's going to yeah. be centered around a particular paradigm or a particular practice. And Which is why you, um, you know, dispelling that my initial... Uh, you know, assumption of the Masons mm -hmm. uh, as kind of not being that at all. I would have, or you know what I mean, not yeah. as much as I think. Most I wouldn't people... really label Freemasonry as a as a magical or a cult group. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, again, it depends on the lodge, and so right. like my lodge, Esoterica Lodge, uh, I wouldn't necessarily label them as a magical or a cult group, but it attracts a lot of those sorts of people. Right. So a lot of the members of my lodge are parts of. You know, are practitioners of different, you know, magical systems mm -hmm. or members of different orders or religious groups or, or things like that that are yeah. that are, you know, non-traditional or sometimes very esoteric or part of the Western mystery tradition. Mm -hmm. um, one group that I think is pretty interesting and fairly well represented in Portland is the uh, the Apostolic Joanite Church. Hmm. And they are a like I'm write that down. It's a branch of, of um, esoteric Christianity, right? And they're pretty cool. There's a couple. There's a, a, there's a there's a there's a good handful of them here. Apostolic what? Joanite. Joanite. Joanite, like J O H, A N N I T E. Gotcha. Yeah, um, and they're a, they're a pretty good group. Um, I think that they're worth checking out and worth exploring if uh, if Christianity doesn't you know rub you the wrong way. Well, I mean, yeah, God, I mean it. <laughs> It, I mean, I might. it did just as a, you know, yeah. especially just being raised a little shit kicking punk rocker <laughs> somewhat. But and, you know, I mean, it's just mm -hmm. that it's an authoritarianism uh, thing, you know. Yeah, there's not a lot of authoritarianism there. Um, right. So, it, I mean, but what I'm finding, too, is through all the practices, how much of it really is mired in, you know, the Christian, you know. Christianity has been the dominant paradigm right. in our culture for, you know, fifteen hundred years. Mm -hmm. So, it's made its way into everything, um, yeah. and I think that you know that's something that um, you know I'm I'm not Christian, and mm -hmm. uh, just even like becoming a Mason and working through Freemasonry, having to come to terms with that because so I, I grew up in rural Oregon, right? And being not Christian in rural Oregon is is an unpleasant experience. <laughs> I know so, yeah. so having to like having to overcome like this the the amount of hostility and um, and crap that was thrown my way by so called Christians while I was growing up was was a was a hurdle. You know, I mean, that's oh, something absolutely. you, you, you yeah. have to. Why sort would of, you ever yeah. consider being a part of that? Yeah, yeah. So you have to kind of like understand the difference between individuals, the, the people, and, yeah. and the the system itself. So, yeah, I don't know. You know so it really came me gave me a run around because it's the same where i grew up in the you know the barrios of the southwest with catholicism mm -hmm. um and recently i'm about to out myself here but uh i've been working with santa muerte oh nice and uh well not not so much recently i guess it's been almost a year now mm -hmm. um fantastic partner uh very very excited about her but she opened me up into this different facet of the kind of neglected or unrecognized, mm -hmm. you know, Catholics, because she's not a uh, recognized saint. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, she is, for all intents and purposes, a part of that whole, mm -hmm. you know, universe. And they, it just kind of opened up my eyes that it's not so dogmatic uh, when you get down to the nitty gritty, it really is just kind of church. Or, yeah. You know, not secular is not the right word, but like. Sometimes it's community base. oriented. Yeah. Sometimes it's it's more open to like personal interpretation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, I know some other uh, Santa Morte pract uh, mm -hmm. practitioners or devotees or whatever. And um, and I've seen that before. Mm -hmm. And uh, and even then, you know, so 
that that's another that reminds me of like other options you know there's always um uh like initiatic style of religion such as voodoo or santeria right and uh, I... and then you know i mean but for me you know i really don't like anybody telling me what Word. to believe or do or i i rebel against dogma pretty strongly and right um so for me i guess uh i just enjoy collecting interesting friends and spending yeah. time around them and sometimes you know collaborating on ritual work or collaborating on stuff but uh you know and i've, I've been a part of of groups that have um formed kind of like you know ad hoc magical lodges mm -hmm. or or have you know adapted ritual to to sort of like lodge style magical workings or things like that but Mostly, I just go solitary. I want to thank again my guest, Eric L. Arneson. Hope to be uh, talking with him a bunch, especially through this medium of podcasting. Please listen to my alchemical romance wherever podcasts are listened to. You can also follow him on Twitter, of which he is very skilled at using at Arnemancy, that's A-R-N-E-M-A-N-C-Y, and uh, there's his blog of the same name, arnemancy.com. Thanks for everyone for hanging out during the silent month of June on this front. I utilized that month to complete a major personal um, artistic project in the form of my 10th musical release of original songs as Dakota Slim. It's, it's called Cactus Crown, and it's my testament to love and magic. And uh, you can find it anywhere, streamable, where music is streamable. But personally, I would purchase it through Bandcamp at dakotaslim.bandcamp.com, where you'll receive all the art, the lyrics, liner notes, and in high-quality audio. As it's meant to be listened in headphones. Absolutely. You should... Consider subscribing to our Patreon at patreon.com slash we the hallowed. There you'll find full unedited interviews like this one with Eric, records like the Dakota Slim record, and others such as zines, audio sigils, what have you. I'll leave you now with a shameless plug from the new Dakota Slim record, Cactus Crown, which is called The Calico Ghost. So, Aunt.